If you enjoy the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentinterview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. So then moved on to the Wildcat. Can you tell us your first thoughts on the aircraft? So the Wildcat is a, an absolute generational leap in capability uh, compared to a Lynx. So it, it comes from the same family uh, of the Lynx and it's the great thing about it, it's inherited all the, the good features of the Lynx and uh, um, you know, the things that work well that don't actually really need to be designed, redesigned. So you know, the rotor head, all of that sort of stuff you know, that gives it that agility and the control power. It's still got those features. It's still got the deck lock harpoon. It's still got the um, you know the the uh, very heavy duty undercarriage with you know the shock absorbing oleos uh, to you know impact you know that take that heavy impact when you land on a pitching heaving deck. Um, so, but the the thing that's really moved it on is the avionics and sensors and stuff like that. And in that regard, it's a completely different aircraft to Lynx. Uh, you know, it's just they're not really comparable. Uh, did it take over the same role as a Lynx? Essentially? Yeah, so for the Navy, again, mm. specifically, it was procured for anti-surface unit warfare uh, and in that role. Uh, but again, it inherited all the other roles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just carry on. Uh, yeah, it, inherited, uh, it inherited all the other roles of um, the, the Lynx before it. So, you know, the submarine warfare, search and rescue, you know, and all, all those other sort of uh, intangible roles that you know, the the links used to carry out, uh, you know, including sort of moving secondary roles, moving passengers about, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but because the Wildcat has so much more capability with its sensors, it can do a few more things that the links could never do. Um, so it, it can do a bit more of an ISR type role as well, um, which the the links wasn't ever really capable of because it didn't have the right sensors for it. So, for people who are not aware, what's the visual differences compared to the Lynx? Uh, so, the, the visual differences, I guess, to the Lynx are that the Wildcat looks a little bit more uh, chunky. Uh, it's a lot more angular and squared off. It's not quite as rounded uh, as, the, as the Lynx, so it looks a little bit more brutal. Um, the thing that will you know, mark a Wildcat out compared to Lynx is the two-tone grey camouflage scheme. Uh, and you'll see that on both Army and Navy variants of the um, uh, of the UK Wildcat. It's got uh, twin tail fins as well, so it's got a horizontal stabiliser which is under the ta tail boom. Okay. Uh, and the tail boom is probably the easiest way to describe it, sort of like a Toblerone <laughs> shape. It's sort of you know a triangular shape with sort of not with pointy sides on it, but the, you know they're squared off, um, and that. Um, and the and the uh, tailplane sits underneath that, and then it has end fins on um, on the ends of the of the tail boom, which you never really had with the Lynx. And if you look at, I think the, well, this one doesn't have it, but you know, all the other Lynx variants have a you know a single tail f tail fin coming out the starboard side at the top of the tail pylon. And with the ground training, did it, did, did you have to basically start again, or, or did, was it basically just a little transition from the Lynx? So the ground training for the Wildcat was. I think three or four weeks of ground school in the okay. uh, in a new facility that, that they built as part of the whole program at Yeovilton called the Wildcat Training Centre, and that has um, high-tech classrooms of computer-based learning. Uh, it's got two full mission simulator devices. It's got a fixed training device, which is basically the same as the simulators, but it just doesn't have motion right. and sits flat on the floor. Uh, and then various procedural trainers, uh, as well as ground maintenance trainers. So they've got a mechanical and an avionics um, ground maintenance um, trainer. So it's a really high tech uh, facility. So you gain, you learn a lot about the systems. You go into a lot of detail uh, on all the systems. Some of it is isn't new because 
it was inherited from the Lynx and one of the things about the Wildcat was when they uh, designed it, it had to have the same footprint physically as a Lynx oh, okay. um, to fit in Royal Navy ships. So the actual you know, nose to tail, length, the height the, you know, the, and the width of the helicopter is exactly the same as the, the Lynx before it. Uh, and they also uh, had a plan to take those, a lot of those Lynx bits that worked and didn't really need redesigning uh, to refurbish them as a retired Lynx uh, and then put them into Wildcat. So there's a few items that go into a Wildcat. Unfortunately, it's not as many as they thought it would be because the, the Wildcat's a significantly um, heavier uh, helicopter. It's, it's much stronger uh, and some of those parts that came from the Lynx weren't really strong enough to go into a Wildcat and they had to basically um, make new ones with um, increased structural integrity to um, you know, go in the link, uh, go in the wildcat. And was it all digital in the cockpit? And uh, was that a nice upgrade? Yep. So in the wildcat, the it's got no analog instruments at all. Oh really? Um, so wow. not even the backup instruments are analog. The whole aircraft is digital um, right across. So it's a very clean. Um, looking cockpit. One of the strangest things I found going from flying things like the Lynx and having been in other military helicopters over the years is that there's a very unique um, oil and fuel smell in military helicopters and anybody who's ever been on one at an air show will know that smell or as, as flew them will know that smell uh, but when we, when we first um, got the Wildcats they were very um, you know, clean inside they don't have as much bare metal in the, you know around the inside of the cabin and stuff like that so it's got like a rubberized floor it's got um, plastic trim in inside the cockpit so there's nothing really exposed to it, it had that new car smell that was a really weird thing about it you know getting into a military <laughs> helicopter that smelled like a new bmw wow. that had just come out of the dealership so how many crew members could it hold or can it hold sorry well, so the wildcat is generally designed for two crew so a pilot uh, and an observer uh, for most submissions so you know anti anti-submarine anti-surface unit warfare will generally be that if there's other sort of missions you know maybe that involves gunnery the the observer can um, you know, jump out the front cockpit, get into the, the rear cabin and operate the gun okay. and stuff like that. But we quite often would maybe the Navy would augment it with a you know a gunner and they may they may retrain a holdover to do that. They may take the in the past they've taken gunners on loan from the Army Air Corps. Okay. They've trained engineers so it just because it's not a permanent role of the aircraft and they don't need somebody to permanently do that, they'll take people from other sort of areas and, and sort of temporarily put them in there. Um, each flight, one of the maintainers is nominated as a winchman, uh, and he gets trained up to be a winchman. Uh, and he, uh, so if there's search and rescue to be done with the aircraft, um, because when a, a wildcat or a lynx in the, in the day was at sea on a, on a frigate or a destroyer, you know, the aircraft's nominated for search and rescue um, by day only. Um, so therefore, it, it has to be able to go out and you know winch people up, and we've. You know, some of the guys over the years did some quite gnarly rescues with you know oh, a, pretty, really? a pretty small uh, helicopter. Uh, you know, uh, you know, rescuing you know, uh, merchantmen from a, a sinking you know vessel because that you know the the Royal Navy warship was the only vessel in the area and they had the you know a helicopter that could you know, rescue people and you know doing multiple runs trying to pick up all the people. How often would that happen? Was that like uh, rare? Uh, it's not that common, but it, you know in my time it happened probably three or four times at least. You know where you know there was a, you know people were deployed around the globe and and something like that happened they had to rescue a load of mer merchantmen. Uh, so yeah, what like like I say, one of the maintainers he gets trained up to be the you know the the um, winchman and then the observer will get back, get into the rear of the cabin and operate the you know the rescue hoist. That must be uh, a very really. rewarding uh, mission. Yeah, I guess it is. I mean, I've never really had to do it, um, but you know, although I trained for it a lot, you know, uh, and, and all Lynx and Wildcat air crew are all trained to do it. Uh, you know, it's not the same level as a you know, search and you know, pure blood search and rescue guys, but you know, we could. You know, we are capable of going out and rescuing people out of the water, or off a ship, or off a cliff, or anything like that. Um, you know, by day. Um, you know, crew members as well. So, the, you know, the the Lynx and the Wildcat have different variants exported around the world. So some of those are purely anti-submarine variants, and they have dipping sonar on the back. So yeah. those helicopters will tend to fly around with three you know crews. So you have a 
a pilot, a tactical coordinator, uh, and uh, officer, and a um, uh, you know a sonar operator in the back operating the sonar. Great stuff. So, can you tell us some of the strengths and weaknesses of the Wildcat? So the strengths of the Wildcat, you know, in terms of you know airframe, they're the same as the Lynx, you know, speed, uh, performance, or, or agility, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, the, all those things that make it a really good maritime helicopter, like the control power, the um, deck lock, and the undercarriage for you know helping it to operate in very poor weather. Those still stand. Uh, it's got a lot more power than the Lynx. It's significantly more powerful. You can so, feel that. oh yeah, yeah, wow. definitely. You, you know, the engines are bigger. Um, you know, so you can much higher rates of climb, even though the helicopter is significantly heavier than the, than the Lynx. Um, but the main thing that really sets the Wildcat apart is its sensors uh, and the integration of those sensors. And there's no uh, maritime helicopter in the world really that has the level of integration that the Wildcat has in terms of you know the, how the sensors all are fused together and all that sensor fusion so you know, the radar working with the electro optics working with the AIS system which is basically ship transponders for those that don't know what AIS is and all overlaying that onto you know a tactical picture within the cockpit uh, you know the ability to be able to you know uh, part, partition off certain geographical areas and either get the systems to specifically look in those areas or specifically to exclude those areas, that sort of stuff, and the manipulation of the system. So, you know, when the aircraft was designed, um, Westlands at the time, now Leonardo, um, invited various uh, aircrew down to you know, Yeovil. Uh, to help, you know, to ask them what they wanted out of a system and how to develop it, and because they had that integration and it wasn't just purely engineers who've never flown in a helicopter yeah. doing it they you know created a system architecture that made it really intuitive and somebody who doesn't know about the wildcat specifically but maybe knows about you know radar and eo systems could probably quite quickly get in the cockpit pick up how to use it without having to oh, okay. um you know, r do lots of reading on it although you still have to do the reading to understand the actual yeah. capability of what, what it can actually do but you could you could certainly pick it up at a very basic level just by you know just exploring what the buttons do on the you know on the system could you maybe explain to our viewers an average day as a wildcat pilot an average day as a wildcat pilot um i guess it depends on what your role is as a wildcat pilot for me my most of my time as a wildcat pilot was as a um, qualified helicopter instructor so you know, it could depend on whether you know you're day flying or night flying you know what time you turn to on the squadron so if you're night flying especially in the summer you might not be coming in until about lunchtime because you you might not be landing on till about 2 a.m in the morning right, yeah um you know if you were unlucky enough to go second wave um but generally you know it, you know up to two sorties a day each sortie lasts about two one hour 30 to two hours there's a briefing which is an hour before the sortie you know and if it's the student they've got to prep even before that you know briefing so that's another sort of 45 minutes to an hour of prep time you know before you brief uh, and then fly the sortie come back sign in all you know the aircraft do all the post flight admin uh, and then um you uh debrief afterwards which again depending on what was involved especially you know if it's a training story though then the, the debrief could be quite extensive you know and mm. it could be 45 minute debrief potentially mm. maybe even an hour in some cases if it's just a crew doing continuation training then the debrief might be quite short 10 or 15 minute sort of debrief of what they did because you know they're used to working together and and, and doing the, the role and um, so when you put that into sort of two sorties a day it can make for a very long busy day and not yeah. not a lot of time to do much uh, in between you know so you know one you know one sortie is probably you know from start to finish between four to five hour wow. e evolution so you know two of those a day looking at an eight to ten hours of just doing stuff around aviation not a lot of time for you know doing so, you know other activity and but you be flying every day you that? don't always fly every day right. so you know when on those days when you don't fly you've got time to um you know, pick up other stuff if you're on the ship then you know the ship you'll know generally what the tasks are and the tasks are laid you know, out 
um, you know, a day or two in advance, and it depends whether you're just working with your ship or you're working in a, you know, a coalition of various other you know, ships, uh, and then you've got um, basically a tasking order which will dictate which all the helicopters, you know, what tasks all the helicopters are doing. So generally, what you do is you, know, you might know that you're going to fly between one and you know four. Uh, one on sort of 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. in the afternoon doing a particular, you know, maybe a surface search or something like that. So, but you'll have a alert period and the alert period sort of 12 hours, um, you know, during the day. So you'll get up at the start of that alert period before it and, and brief for it. Um, you know, and that, that brief involves the captain, the, you know, the pr you know, principal warfare officer, the ops officer, flight deck officer, the air crew, and anybody else that's involved in aviation. So there's quite a few people at that brief and it covers all the usual sort of aviation aspects like met and all of that sort of stuff what the aircraft's going to do and then runs through all the different you know other things like comm plans and you know, all that kind of stuff and then you might not do anything for a while until you've got your your planned in sorry but equally because you're alert you're at 15 minutes notice to get airborne mm. so you you could suddenly hear action links action links or action wildcat action wildcat and you could be you know Doing something else, you know, either doing some you know, admin work in your office or you know, sat in the wardroom having a coffee, mm -hmm. uh, and you might hear that, and you've got basically to you know, sprint down the back of the hangar, do the walk around if you haven't already done it, or you should have already done it at this stage, and you know, get in the aircraft, get it started, and get airborne off the deck from 15 minutes within that pipe, you know, be that pipe being co called out, um, you know, action links. It's never a dull moment then. <laughs> so yeah, it could, it could be quite busy if you if you're doing that sort of stuff, and that might be because you know something unexpected's happened to ship that they weren't expecting that they want to look at has appeared somewhere over the horizon. You know, a search and rescue th you know event has occurred. You know, it's usually for you know unscheduled, unexpected tasks. So have you flown on any large exercises with the Wildcat? Uh, have flown on a few large exercises, but they were mostly to do with counter-terrorism stuff, so I can't really talk a lot about them. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. So, do you have any memorable stories from your time flying the Wildcat? Yeah, I've got um, one, uh, you know, particular one. I, um, because I did a lot, of, you know, a lot of training and stuff like that. I used to um, have to do other things like fly pasts and, and that kind of stuff. We got tasked to do a fly pass for the commemorating the Channel Dash. Uh, and it was down in Ramsgate uh, in Kent, and it, there was a memorial being un unveiled to the, the Channel Dash and the squadron that I was on was 825 Naval Air Squadron, which is the squadron that carried out the Channel Dash with the swordfish in the Second World War. And for those that don't know the story, it was basically a suicide mission. All, all of the aircraft got shot down and only um, three people uh, survived it. Uh, so a really uh, heroic, you know, tale you know of World War Two sort of you know naval aviation. So eight two five naval air squadron we you know commemorate it with the Channel Dash Association. We've been asked to do this fly past the, you know all the way over in Ramsgate so it involved a couple of refuels you know on the way there and back. Uh, and we, my boss was there on the ground, as was the, you know the, one of the um, squadron executives, and they were there out in their best bib and tucker in their number one uniform with all the dignitaries and all that kind of stuff. And and it was a four ship fly past, which I was leading. So we'd been to ODM, refueled, and we were en route to Ramsgate to basically do this fly past on the second. And we're somewhere south of Guildford, and um, the air traffic controller c came on the air and said, um, "Tell them information." Uh, We've just had a um, call from your um, operating authority. You need to relax the fly pass by like 50 minutes. Oh. <laughs> um, and I was like, well, thanks, Bubble. What are we going to do? And um, 50, 50 minute relax is a lot. And we didn't have the fuel to hang around for 50 minutes in the air. We didn't have the time to go somewhere and refuel four helicopters and get airborne in 50 minutes. <laughs> And luckily, I remember that you know, Head Corn Airfield was just about five miles to the southeast of us. I said, right, let's all go into Head Corn. So I called them up on the radio, and it's just an air ground operator. I said, hey, this is us. We're four Wildcat helicopters. Uh, we're coming in. <laughs> just basically <laughs> didn't even ask, just told them. Yeah, we're going. And these four Wildcat helicopters just descended upon them. We came in, shut down for about 15, 20 minutes. Just that was enough to save us the fuel. Yeah. And. Um, and then restart, and then we went off and did the fly past, and we made it to the second. Wow. Um, 
about 50 minutes later than you know we were supposed to and it was all because just the dignitaries had, had run late that <laughs> so, must be quite annoying yeah it was a little <laughs> bit but it, it, you know it, it, worked it, out. it worked out in the end our biggest you know, worry i guess was trying to make sure that four aircraft started up again <laughs> and we didn't have any snags and lose one but it all worked out in the end but it was a a bit of a thinks bubble at the time. <laughs> yeah, brilliant stuff. So how would you sum up the Wildcat? Uh, the Wildcat is uh, you know, very, very capable uh, helicopter. Um, it's a lot of fun to fly from a pilot's point of view because it's very maneuverable, but in terms of a you know, combat system, it's just, um, I think, unbeatable in terms of its capability, its mission sy system integration, its sensor capability, uh, and all of that sort of stuff uh, you know, in, in the role. It's, a, you know, it's just an incredibly uh, capable helicopter, um, uh, you know, and unbeatable in that regard right now. Uh, there's a side note here. Do they still have the display team out there? I think they are called the Wildcats, aren't they? Oh, the Black Cats, the yeah. Black so Cats, sorry. The Royal Navy uh, helicopter display team, the Black Cats. Yeah, they. Ha I think they or I'm not so much in touch with that world anymore, um, but uh, you know, they certainly had one aircraft last year. You know, the number of aircraft they have depends on the resource that they've got available, mm. either the instructors to do it or the, um, you know, or they, you know, the allocation of aircraft and stuff like that. So it depends. I don't. Hopefully, they'll bring you know, the second aircraft back in at some point in the future, but I don't know when that would be. You'd have to ask the Royal Navy about that. Yeah. <laughs>So Simon, you also flew the swordfish. How did this come about? Uh, so I always had an interest in aviation and warbirds and, and all those sort of stuff. So you know, one of the things that I made an objective when I joined the Navy was to try and get on to the Royal Navy Historic Flight oh, okay. and, and get to fly them one day. Um, yeah. so, when I, so when I got my wings, got qualified on the um, front line, I basically just volunteered for as much flying as possible to build my hours up because in those days the Historic Flight I think had a, like a 2,000 hour wow. entry requirement uh, So I, and I knew that that's what it required and so I basically just did as much flying as I could and I volunteered for, you know, crappy duties that people didn't want to do <laughs> flying wise I, I you know I'd do check test flights on the Friday afternoon that nobody wanted to do um, and I built hours up quite quickly and I d accelerated quite quickly ahead of you know my peer group and people that I went through training with in terms of flying hours um, it was a bit I was a bit of an hours hog to say the <laughs> least I and amongst that as well I did some private flying I, I kept a private pilot's license so I tried to you know, gain experience, just build experience flying tailwheel aircraft mm. and uh, you know, aerobatic aircraft and, and some vintage sort of light aircraft types as well. Um, just again to build that portfolio of you know, relevant experience that the Royal Navy Historic Flight needed. And then, you know, come the time I thought I had enough experience, I wrote a letter to the boss of the Navy Historic Flight at the time, a guy called Mike Abbey, um, and basically said, hey, this is me, this is my, uh, you know, experience, um, you know, I'd like to join the flight one day. And he said, yep, yeah, you're just the sort of guy we're after right now. We don't have any slots, but come, you know, maybe in the future we will. And then a few months later, he invited me over for a coffee to the historic flight. And one, one of the guys, you know, had left the flight and he had a slot open and I ended up joining the flight. So I joined uh, Royal Navy Historic Flight around April 2010. What was that like when you got that call or that? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was absolutely you know, blown away to be actually you know invited to go and do it. Uh, you know that's for sure. Um, you know, it's a real privilege to get to fly those sort of aircraft. Um, you because know, not everybody gets to do do it, and you have to have the right kind of background to do it. You know, they just won't let anybody you know, rock up and, f and fly those aircraft because of what they are and the experience you need. So luckily, I had always had a goal of of doing that and ma made sure i'd given myself the right sort of you know flying experience to actually you know be credible to actually go and join the flight and what was it like to fly uh the swordfish so the swordfish is a brutal airplane to fly oh really uh, yeah so although it's a you know a big slow biplane and a lot of people sort of take the mickey out of it because it's you know it, it, it's not particularly quick it's open cockpit and the, you know the engine is uh, 750 horsepower nine cylinder uh, radial um, pegasus engine uh, with a big three bladed prop which is just under 13 foot in diameter 
So, you know, at full power, it's throwing a lot of air um, back over the fuselage. Uh, so it's very, very noisy. And I, I mean, I remember when I first flew it, you know, it was in the days before we had an air earplugs like CEPs and things like that and vamps that, which most military aircrew will be familiar with these days. We didn't have that, it was just normal, you know, Mark IV or Mark X uh, helmets. In fact, I, I, I used to fly the Mark X uh, and an oxygen mask but without the hose on it um, because you can't, you can't fly with a boom mic, one, because you know, just the wind blast onto the boom mic <laughs> and two, um, you know, there was a uh, with the RTS and stuff like that, they considered like you know boom mic to be a snagging hazard in parachute lines if you ever had to bail out. Um, so that's why if you, you if people ever saw pictures of us, wonder maybe wondering why that we flew with oxygen masks and stuff in in the swordfish. That's why. But uh, yeah, so it's brutally noisy. And one of the things I remember because I don't have C didn't have CEP in those days was getting out after a, a flight and you know when you you know that feeling when you've been to a really loud nightclub and your hearing's dull afterwards and you can't hear properly <laughs> for a couple of hours. That's what the swordfish was like. It was wow. you know, brutally brutally noisy. Yeah, you know, and you know to be able to the radio fit that we had in the early days when I flew it um, wasn't great. You used to have to throttle back, lower your seat, put your head fully under the cockpit, listen to the radio call or, or, or and make it and then jack your seat up, throttle back up because you could, you know, in the cruise with the seat up you couldn't, you know, hear at all. It was so, so loud. And then CEPs came along and they made such a difference plus they changed the radio fit and then actually you fly it a bit more normally so you could, didn't have to move the seat up and down and the, and the radio volumes were all really good and stuff like that and you could actually hear you know, what air traffic were, were telling you. That would but help, wouldn't it? Yeah, you know, uh, the rear cockpits have all, you know, also flown in both the rear cockpits of the swordfish as well. Um, and times so the further back you go in the aircraft the more brutal it becomes so the pilot is actually very well um, sheltered and the cockpit side sort of come up to your your shoulders there's only really this much above you and you've got your windscreen yeah. uh, in front of you so you're actually you know despite all of that quite well sheltered um, from the wind blast uh, but when you go into the uh, observer's cockpit you know you stand up in the back of that and the, you have a dispatcher um, harness who you know, at that point as well, the slipstream of the propeller starts to spill into the rear cockpits as well from the right hand side. So you'll get be getting a bit of um, your propeller slipstream as well as your know, wind blast and stuff. Wow. But you can sort of shelter up behind the pilot's cockpit a little bit, so you can sort of tuck yourself up in there. And there's a little fold down stool that comes up, and you can sit down so you can get out of that. When you go, uh, and the sort of cockpit sides of that are sort of like mid, sort of you know, on me anyway. Um, sort of you know, mid-abdomen sort of height. When you go into the uh, telegraph stair gunner's cockpit at the very rear of the aircraft, the cockpit sides are sort of down at waist height uh, <laughs> and you get the full blast of the wind, you get a load of um, the slipstream coming in over the cockpit and you know, one of the things that unfortunately with that is you get the exhaust fumes as well. No. So even though you're <laughs> right out in the open air, if you start, uh, if you're um, in it for too long or you sit down and, and shelt so you've got two options. One, stand up and get the full force of the air blowing over the aircraft at 100 knots and just get absolutely back. It's basically like standing in a hurricane for an, you know, an hour if you, if you did like a transit or something like that. And, and you know, some of the transits we did you know, went up to Sunderland and stuff like that. Yeah. They were like two or three hour transits in the aircraft because the aircraft can easily make it to, from Yeovilton to Edinburgh in one hit. Now, oh, wow. I, I've flown it from Yeovilton to Edinburgh in one hit and that's about you know, three, three and a bit hours of wow. flying in one sortie. Um, so you know, the guy in the back is absolutely ruined by the time he gets there. <laughs> but if you sit down and shelter, the cockpit pulls up with carbon monoxide, so you end up like you know, even though it's an open cockpit aircraft, you get a lot of carbon monoxide sort of pulling in that in that rear cockpit, and it, you know, so it was very, if you spent too long sitting sheltering, you'd end up you know a bit of a headache <laughs> <laughs> most of the weekend. But but overall, did you enjoy flying the aircraft? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely enjoyed it. You anyway, know, how could you not? It's um, a unique aircraft, and you know, in certainly in warbird terms, it was you know the only one flying in the world. You know, at the moment they still are. You know, the only one flying in the world um, right now uh, so you know real unique privilege to be able to fly an aircraft like that and you know the uh, swordfish is to the fleet air arm what you know Spitfire is to the Royal Air Force in yeah. terms of its you know war history and, and stuff and the things it did and you you look at the all, all the operations it was involved with in the Second World War you know just absolutely 
amazing you know some of the things that they did and got away with and, and quite often you know they were the you know the underdog because they're flying the old slow outdated biplane even by those um you know by world war ii standards it was a, you know, an old slow outdated airplane but you know some of those things that made it old slow and outdated also were some of its strong points as mm -hmm. well simon do you have any hobbies uh, well, yeah, those that know me well know that I uh, fly a lot anyway, so I, my hobby <laughs> it generally tends to be flying. I really, it's either flying or cycling. Um, but yeah, I do, haven't done so much flying over the last couple of years, but I do a bit of private flying um, and I've flown all sorts of stuff over the years. I've got uh, a Pitts S1S, oh, nice. um, which I you know, do a bit of flying in from time to time. I've got a little micro light as well, a um, little tail wheel micro light. So I've got a couple of uh, aeroplanes. My wife is a pilot. Um, she's also a QFI at um, Barkston Heath on the um, Prefect. Uh, she's also got her own pits. Um, you know, so we do a bit of flying together when we can. I'll go, although again, it's been a while since we've um, managed to do that. This could be an easy one or a hard one. Favorite aircraft you have flown? Favorite aircraft I've flown probably the Swordfish, just because of what it is. It's not the most amazing aircraft to fly in terms of handling you know it's an aircraft of its generation so that you know the handling isn't great and it's a, you know it's a, a brutal bit of kit to fly but it's my favorite because of just the you know the pure history and you know privilege of getting to fly an aircraft like that and and preserving that living history and keeping it alive absolutely when you'd like to fly either past or present uh, that's an easy one. Uh, the Sea Fury, I'd love to fly that. Oh right, okay. <laughs> that's the my bucket list aeroplane. It's the um, you, yeah, it's just you know, the pinnacle aeroplane. Uh, you know because it's the uh, you're right at the pinnacle of piston engine fighter technology and power and speed and you know everybody who's flown a Sea Fury basically will tell you it's their favourite aeroplane that they've ever flown. Okay, right, nice. So, can we find you online or on Twitter, Instagram, anything like that? Yeah, I've got a Twitter account and an Instagram account, although I don't haven't really used them much over the last couple of years. I've sort of just been um, a bit busy. But if you look for Cy Wilson flying, uh, I think they've both got the same handle. Um, you'll, you should be able to find me on right, on so Twitter and Instagram. We'll, we'll link that in the description below. But Simon, thank you very much for coming on the show. Yeah, no worries. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm.